the scripture reading in the sermon has changed since the two weeks ago or whatever it was that I gave it to Katie, so the bulletin does not have that right. We will be reading from the Gospel of John this morning. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, as your scripture is read and proclaimed, open our eyes that we might see you. Open our ears that we might hear you. And open our hearts that we may respond to your love. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. From John chapter 15, 16, sorry, chapter 16, verses 12 to 15. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The word of God for the people of God. I want you to think this morning about how you react when time is short. When one door is closing, another door has not yet opened, but you don't have a lot of time in your current situation. Take coaching, for example. You've been working with your team, teaching them rules and logistics, but preseason is over. The first game is about to start. All of a sudden, you remember there are so many rules that you forgot to teach them. You huddle up the team, you pump them up, and then the litany starts. Now, I forgot to tell you, if you get to first base and you turn like you're running to second, but then you stop, you're going to be out. Keep going if you commit to go. All right, you can only steal once the ball has been released from the pitcher's hand. Oh, or is that when the ball passes the plate? I don't know. Oh, with which you're batting, stay in the batter's box. If you jump out of the batter's box, the umpire is going to call you out. But if you're on third base and the ball goes past the batter, batter better get out of the bait, out of the box, <laughs> or, or, or they're going to get called out. Oh, yeah, I can't remember all the rules. When I look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, I see someone who was never rushed, never hurried, never harried. He was not worried that he had run out of time to say everything he wanted to say. Jesus had time for people. Jesus knew when to speak and what to say and how to say it. He wasn't rigid. Jesus knew how to dance. Today's passage is from Jesus' final discourse in the Gospel of John, his last instructions for them before he would be killed. And he begins by saying, I still have many things to say to you. Now, if you're on second base and the ball gets hurt, hit to shortstop, hold up and wait till shortstop commits the throw to first base, and once the throw is gone, then you take off for third base. No, <laughs> that's not Jesus. He is not frantically trying to shove in all the last-minute details, everything he all of a sudden realizes he hasn't said in the past three years, everything they or we might need to know in this or that situation. He knows, like a smart coach would know, that if he just tried to cram it all in, the reaction would most likely be like deer in the headlight. Can you say TMI? Can you say information overload? Actually, that's what Jesus says. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. 
unlike our last ditch efforts to be in control, full with worry and fear of how things are going to turn out, Jesus is not worried about getting it all in before he leaves. Rather, Jesus knows that at this time, the disciples are not able to truly understand the truth he is speaking. And Jesus knows the spirit of truth will guide them later into all truth. He doesn't need to worry. He knows the disciples are not in control. He knows of their limited ability to understand. Think of how many times throughout the Gospels the disciples just do not get it. They do not understand. Jesus understands. According to the church year calendar, last Sunday was Pentecost Sunday, which celebrates the gift of the Holy Spirit to the church. Sometimes it is referred to as the birthday of the church. At Pentecost, we remember an actual historical biblical event that we find in the book of Acts. Today is Trinity Sunday, which doesn't celebrate an event that we can find in the Bible, but recognizes our doctrine of the Trinity. The doctrine of the Trinity is not easy to explain. Three in one seems like bad math. We chalk it up to God being mysterious, which is true, but there's a part of the Trinity that I think is absolutely beautiful. Here in these four short verses, we get a picture of the Trinity, a very loving, giving, unselfish picture of the Trinity. What God the Father has, he gives to Jesus. What Jesus receives, he passes along to the Holy Spirit. No part of the Trinity is going it alone. God the Spirit leads us to God the Son. God the Son shows us God the Father. They all give and they all receive. There is mutuality, there is communion. It's a beautiful picture of how we are to live. It is very much like a dance. Too often throughout the ages, Christianity has been built on hierarchy and patriarchy, which is so far from the relationship within the triune God. It is not God the Father on top, and God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit on the bottom, it is not a triangle or a pyramid, but a fluid circle where the three dance with one another. Franciscan priest Richard Rohr wrote, what if we actually surrendered to the inner Trinitarian flow and let it be our primary teacher? Our notion of society, politics, and authority, which is still top-down, outside-in, would utterly change. But circles are much more threatening than pyramids are, at least to empires, the wealthy, and the patriarchal system. Yet, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, as Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians was supposed to be our circular and all-inclusive guide. Trinitarian theology says that spiritual power is more circular or spiral, not so much hierarchical. It's here. It's within us. It's shared and shareable. It's already entirely for us and grounded within us what hope this gives. And Paul says in Romans, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured, poured into our hearts 
through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Friends, God's Spirit is planted within us. Rohr continues, Trinity shows that God's power is not any kind of domination, threat, or coercion. If the Father does not dominate the Son, and the Son does not dominate the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit does not dominate the Father or the Son, then there is no domination in God. All divine power is shared power, and the letting go of autonomous power. This God is not seeking control as we do, but handing on the power to the other. There's no seeking to have power over in the Trinity, but only power with, a giving away, a sharing, a letting go, and thus an infinity of trust and mutuality. This should have changed all Christian relationships and marriage and culture and church across borders. Jesus leaves the disciples with the promise of the coming of the truth the spirit of truth, which declares to us, makes known to us, gives understanding to us where there was no understanding. But like Jesus, the spirit gives it little by little, not crammed in, but to help us better understand God's love and God's providence. It is revealed to us little by little. And the Spirit invites us to join the dance. We still need the Spirit of Truth in our lives today. But the Spirit of Truth, as I said, like a smart coach, will allow us the experiences we need to grow and mature and become more and more like Christ. Little by little. And little by little, if we are open to the spirit of truth, we will indeed see that God's ways are not our ways. God's truths are not our truths. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. But fear not. You are invited to join the dance. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.